Okay, so welcome to Faith and Trust in God, lesson number nine. Um, and I'm really excited about tonight's lesson. We've been doing a textual study of duties of the heart, um, the gate of trust, the fourth gate by Rabbi Tachaya Ibn Pakuda. And the reason I'm so excited about tonight's lesson is because tonight we're going to do Hakdama HaChamishis, which means the fifth preface. So for those of you that are regular attendees of the class, you know that there have been, that, that, we've, that for the past four weeks, we've been learning each week another preface, which Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar Bechayev believes are crucial uh, to developing trust in God. Um, number one was believing seven things about God, that God is the epitome of each of the seven prerequisites to trusting any being. In other words, that he has the ability to do good for me, that he wants to do good for me, that everything's in his control, that he has... Uh, the, the, the wherewithal to do it, you know, all, all these sorts of things. That he's a kind being. Those were seven things we discussed. That was preface number one. Another preface was to have exclusive trust in God, right? Another preface was that we should recognize, meaning and not to diversify our trust in other things, to think that the doctor has, also has, has uh, some sort of control over my outcome or that my, my stock uh, broker has some sort of control over my outcome. I use that example because today was a historic day. I think they're saying today is going down in history, no? In terms of the market? I think so. But today the market reached the, uh, the, 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 quick, the quickness with which uh, the market went down and then went back up. I think today we're back at where we started from before this whole crisis. Um, I think that's like a historical speed which went all the way down and all the way up. If there's any day that shows that we should have trust in Hashem and not in the stock market, I think that uh, today is one of those days. In any event, Oh, Menachem wants to say hi. Okay. Whoa, do not close. Menachem, you want to come say hi? Say hi. Okay. Want to say hi, everybody? Say, say hi, Andrea. Say hi, Arnold. Hi, Menachem. Say hi, Lois. Hi, Menachem. Hi, Menachem. Hi, Menachem. <laughs> okay, say bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 All right. Mute us <laughs> now again. That we're done with, now that we're done with the pleasantries. You can we're, mute, we're, it. mute us again. That's okay. Baruch yeah. Hashem, there's no background noise. Okay. So, where were we here? So, there, are, there have been five prerequisites, five prefaces that Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar has been sharing with us, right? So, one of them was to have exclusive trust in God. That's where we got off, off topic with the market. Um, but in other words, to recognize that even though there might be other instruments that are involved in the process of getting us our uh, sustenance or our health or whatever it is, right, we should recognize that our trust should be in Hashem alone because it's all and exclusively in trust. In other words, any other um, tools that are along the way are fully within Hashem's control. Um, that's when we quoted the Gemara that says, um, that permission has been granted by God to a doctor to heal. In other words, that it's not like the doctor has anything in his control. He's just a tool through which, through which is coming down. Another one was we have to recognize that everything that Hashem does is measure for measure. So we literally have to be good boys, right? In other words, just like uh, uh, um, it would be silly for anybody to trust me, a human being, if they had just slapped me in the face, you know, he slaps me across the face, does something terrible to me, sticks a dagger in my back, and then says, oh, I trust you, you're going to save my life. That would be silly, right? You want to <laughs> make sure that the person that you're trusting is going to say these with Hashem, we should make sure that we're doing good by him if we want him to do good by us. And today we get to preface number five. Preface number five is going to take us a lot longer than one day. Because preface number five is going to talk about the balance between human effort and trust in Hashem. What does that mean? Often during this class, I think probably every one of you at one point has asked me, so one second, you sit here, uh, Rabbi Rifkin, and you darsh and you darsh and you talk and you talk and you talk about how we have to trust in Hashem, not trust in anybody else, not even not a doctor, not a boy. So maybe I should just remove myself from the equation completely. I have a great idea. I'm going to sit on the couch and watch TV, and I'm going to have full trust in Hashem that everything's going to be fucking. Isn't that a great idea? I think it's great. You think it's a great idea. Arnold, Arnold is voting for such a, for such a bad. No, truthfully, we recognize, welcome, Stephanie. Truthfully, we, re- we recognize that this is obviously folly, and Hashem wants us 
to be involved. Hashem wants us to put our best foot forward when it comes to our health, and to find the best doctor and to figure out and to make proper decisions, etc. And when it comes to our finances, Hashem wants us to get a job. Right? Get off the couch. Get a job. Sorry, <laughs> And not just that you get a job, but you should actually try to be good at your job, right? And you should try to try to get a good business deal and put, put your best effort forward. Because if you don't, then Hashem is not going to uh, send your sustenance here. So how does that work? How do I have trust in Hashem and yet do my best? Where is that balance? And that's, so today he's going to introduce this balance to us. And we're going to talk about it a little bit. And over the course of the next few weeks, so today's just going to introduce what the role of that human effort is supposed to be. Um, and over the course of the next, I would say, two or three weeks, we're going to discuss, first of all, biblical and logical proof that human intervention is needed. In other words, that even though we're trusting Hashem, we have to be doing what we can. We're going to talk about why, if we're trusting in Hashem, Hashem can do whatever He wants anyways, then why should I put my best foot forward? Why? Why should I do whatever I can? Uh, we're going to talk about that probably for two or three weeks. With these, with these, we're going to revolve around that topic. And we're going to come to the bottom line at the end of this all that you have to make a vessel for God's blessing. You should know that this is going to help you to keep your mind focused on serving Hashem. The fact that we're going to make a vessel, we're going to, by our efforts, create the vessel into which God's blessing should come. And I know that's an analogy that we haven't spoken about yet, but we'll talk about it over time. <clears throat> that's going to help us keep our mind focused on serving and trusting Hashem. That's going to take us two or three weeks till we get to that. And then after that, we'll talk about sometimes when it's not so important to, to work so hard. That was, here's the limit. Uh, once we're talking kind of, kind of about the path forward, after that, what we can look forward to, I feel like a TV caster is telling you, don't go away, here's what's coming. <laughs> um, so... After that, we're going to talk about two questions, one which people ask very often, one which nobody asks very often. One is, why do, why do bad things happen to good people? And the other one is, why do good things happen to bad people? Uh, so we're, we're going to talk about that. So that's kind of our next five, six weeks laid out. All right? Yep. So for today, we're going to start, start off by talking about human efforts. Arnold, you want to get us started? Right. Go for it. The fifth, sir, uh, fifth preface. It should be clear to a person that every uh, new thing brought about in this world, subsequent to the, cre the creation, is completed by two things. The creator's decree and, and will that it be brought into the realm of existence. B, intermediate causes and means, some of them immediate, uh, immediate and others remote, some evident and others concealed, all racing to complete what was ordained to come into existence and be revealed with God's help. Okay, so anything that happens in this world following the original creation, right? In other words, there was this moment 5,780 years ago when in six days God created the world. And ever since that moment, anything that comes into this world happens by a combination of two things, okay? I don't care if it's your stock portfolio or if it's your health or if it's coronavirus or if it's the, the next uh, meteor that's going to hit the earth and destroy three quarters of the population, right? It doesn't make a difference. The great flood, you know, all these things, they happen by a combination of two things, okay? Number one is their original raison d'etre, or, or uh, that's a bad, that's actually a bad term to use. Number one is their original, their origin. In other words, what, what, what we're going to say is attributed to Hashem, but what we mean is, where it comes from to begin with. And number two are these human intermediate causes along the way. Intermediate causes and means. Now, these things are not going to be what caused this thing to happen in the world. Everything comes from Hashem. But there are these different intermediate things along the way which can happen through human effort, which can change them. If this is cryptic to you, don't worry. Um, Rabbeinu Bechaya has your back. Um, Lois, you want to read for us? He has an analogy for us. An example. An example of an immediate cause is the extraction of water from the depths of the earth by means of a wheel with attached buckets in which water is drawn out of the well. The remote cause is the man who harnesses a beast to the wheel and so makes the wheel revolve, which draws the water from the bottom of the well to the surface. 
The intermediate means between the man and the buckets are the beast, the pulleys that move each other, and the rope. If anything should go wrong with one of these means, the objective for which they are implied, employed sorry, will not be reached. So here we have an example. Says Rabbeinu Bechaya, thank you, Lois. Mm -hmm. Says Rabbeinu Bechaya that very often in life, and he's giving us an example here, you have this with physical movement of something from place to place when you're drawing something forth from one place to another, right? Take the example of water, right? So the most remote cause, or the most remote, what was the word they used in the translation? Yeah, the remote cause is the man, okay? Now, if you were to look at this situation, you actually wouldn't even see the man. If you were to look at this process by which the water is getting from the depths of the earth, in the middle of this well, dug 50, 80, 150 feet into the ground, right? Um, by the, the process by which the water is going from down there, all the way to the man's cup, you actually wouldn't even see the man's involvement. Only at the last second would you see the man take the cup of water and drink it. Right. Because he's the remote cause. Now, you and I all know um, that obviously it's the man who orchestrated the whole thing, who designed the whole thing, who planned the whole thing. And if it wasn't for his causing this whole process to be, to be in existence, it wouldn't be. The water would still be exactly where it was. Right? But if you look with very superficial eyes, you look at the water coming out, coming out of the well, and you say, it's the bucket. Right? And as you go along, you, if you don't attribute it to the bucket, you'll attribute it to, the, to, the, to the, the harness, or to the chain, or to the, the pulley, or the beast that's pulling the water, right? that's driving the energy, right? or in today's day and age, the electricity, or the, the, whatever, the pump, whatever, right? the, the hydraulic system, whatever it is, Whatever sophisticated system it is with many, many different steps along the way that's causing the water to get from point A all the way to point, let's call it Z, right? The, this is his analogy for when something happens in this world and there might be human effort involved along the way. As Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar himself elaborates. Ron, you want to you drive it home for us? So, Ron? Okay. You got it. So, so it is with the other acts that are brought into actuality. They, they cannot arise from man or anything else except by the decree of God and unless he prepares the means for their completion. So, so pause for a moment. I just want to point out that that was a two-part sentence, okay? Number one was, unless they're decreed by God, right? So that would lead you to believe, oh, Okay, no problem. So God sits in heaven, and he's basically just a decision maker. He sits there with a big check and a big X, and he stamps. This should go, this shouldn't go, right? But he's not really involved in everything. But Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar doesn't leave it there, right? It's, this is a crucial point. Hashem is not just a, 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 a supervisor. He doesn't just oversee everything and decide what's going to come down into the world, what's going to be successful, and what's not going to be. What's going to come down into the world and what won't. Hashem actually is, is involved. As he continues, he says, except by the decree of God, and unless he prepares the means for their completion, right? Just like the human being who sets up the whole system. In any event, Ron, pick it up where you left off. Sorry for interrupting you. Okay, as it, is, as it says, by him all feats are measured, great in counsel and mighty in deed. For it, it was a turn of events brought about, by, brought about by God. If the means are entirely lacking, and none of the natural activities can be brought into actuality. Thank you, Ron. So to go back to our analogy, imagine if you remove the human being from the equation, right? You had everything else. No human beings involved. You're observing from behind the window, you know, like they observe uh, uh, criminals in a, in a holding cell or whatever it is, but right? you're observing just like, or, or whatever, or like the, the, the scientists do with, uh, with the test subjects. You're kind of looking from a, an overview, as, as a bird's eye view, you look down, you see a beast, some sort of beast. You see a chain, you see a harness, you see a bucket, you see a well, you see the water down there, right? Your chin, and you see the cup where it's supposed to end up, right? There's no way that this process would happen if you removed the human being from the equation, right? And nobody, nobody would be so foolish as to say, somehow it did. Similarly with Hashem. Yes, it's true that there might be different details involved. For instance, if it's, if it's a medical situation, there is a doctor involved, there's medical equipment involved, there's certain scientific breakthroughs involved, probably certain scientists involved. 
there's certain vaccines involved, etc. Part of the relevance of the subject, but right there's, there's and, and there's all sorts of things involved. But that doesn't take away the fact that if Hashem was removed from the equation, or or as the pasuk says, for it was a turn of events brought about by God. And if the means are entirely lacking, none of the natural activities can be brought into actuality. Not the great flood, and not literally, you know, the piece of bread on my table. A very cosmic example and a very microcosmic example. And this is very, very important to understand. And I know that right now we're focusing on how, how, how much Hashem is involved in the process. And, it, and it's important for us to recognize that as we continue, with, and we're gonna, that's what we're going to focus on today, for the next few weeks, he's going to focus on the opposite. He's, he, he's going to start to talk about, so if that's the case, if Hashem is really in control, despite us being involved on some level, right, then why would we even need to be involved? Okay, so I'm just going to kind of try to forewarn that question. I'm not going to answer it. We'll do that over the next few weeks. But um, that is a question, a big question that's, that's here on the table. We're not going to ignore that. Um, but for now, let's, Let's dive right into what this means, okay? Because here's, here's a really good question. Here's a really good question. So if Hashem is the human being and we, and we are just like the harness or the pulley or whatever it is, so then I don't get it. Why are there different types of scenarios in life? Why is it that sometimes we find that we need to put in a lot of effort and sometimes we need to put in very little effort, right? Before, the, we, before we started this conversation, I would say, okay, here there's more involvement from God, and he wants me to do more, and here there's less involvement from God, and he, wants, and he doesn't want me to do as much, right? But now that we've established that really Hashem is always fully in control, so why is it that sometimes there's kind of, I don't know, you, you, I mean, we all know, I guess let's take an extreme example. Sometimes I work and work and work and work and work for days and weeks and months on end, and I make maybe ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, whatever it is, right? And in one day, someone else wins the lottery, and they make millions and millions and millions of dollars. I don't get it. If he could bring it down easier, if Hashem can make a miracle, if Hashem can make some kind of turn of events, some kind of, why is it sometimes difficult and sometimes easy? Okay. So, in the words of Hasidic philosophy, these two different types of God. Uh, uh, in these two manners through which God interacts with the world are called lechem and mina shamayim and lechem and mina haaretz. Bread from the earth and bread from the heaven. Okay? And what do we mean by that? What we mean by bread from the earth, we mean the, the natural and, and uh, normal order of things, how we go about receiving bread in our lives. Okay? We work the ground, we get wheat. We eventually, right, we plow, we, 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 we plant, eventually we grow, we take it, we winnow it, we, 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 we grind it, we make flour, we put the flour and the water together, we hope it rises, we try to make a starter, you know, the works, right? Until eventually we have bread. Lecha mina shamayim, bread from heaven, refers to, refers to the manna, right? Remember? Remember that? When the Jewish people were in the desert, Hashem took care of them, and he provided them with manna that came down from heaven. And every single day, the Jews were able to go out and collect this bread from heaven, and they didn't, they didn't, they, they didn't go through any of that process we go through. I mean, for goodness sake, they didn't even need to earn money and go to Rouse and buy it. <laughs> right? I mean, I, 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 can't, I can't profess to be a farmer. I can't say that I do spend a lot of time planting and whatever. I'm not even a baker. You know what I mean? But at least I could say that I work hard, I make money, I use that money, I then go to the bakery and I, I buy the bread and somebody else is working hard, so I'm paying him for their efforts. In, in the desert, the Jews, the Jews didn't even do that. Now, that's not to say there was no effort on their part. They had to walk out of their tent and collect it. <laughs> so there was effort, but obviously that effort isn't comparable. So let's dive into this. Um, Stephanie, you want to read for us a little bit? Let's start here. It is explained. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. It's explained that there are two types of bread. Leham men hauza, a bread of the earth, and lechem men ha mayan, mana, bread from heaven, which was given to the Israelites in the desert after they left Egypt. The difference between the two breads is not who is the orchestrator 
of the substance that the bread from the earth comes from human efforts, sowing, planting, reaping, etc. Well, the manna came from heaven. Rather, their difference lies in the human perception. Despite the fact that there is human involvement by the bread of he from heaven, namely the Israelites had to leave his tent and collect the manna and then had to consume it. Still, overbearing perceptions was that it was from heaven, a gift from Hashem. Okay, so he says, really what's the difference? I don't get it. We have um, bread from the earth. Bread from the earth, we put a lot of effort into it. We have bread from heaven. We still have to put effort into it. But for, for the most part, it came from heaven. So if you add up all of the ingredients, we have the same ingredients. It's just the quantity that's different. There's human intervention, there's human effort, and there's godly intervention. Hashem has to send it out to us, right? No, no wheat grows from the ground without Hashem deciding that it should grow. And of course, the manna certainly didn't come down without Hashem telling, telling it to come down. Yet at the same time, if the human being would not have gotten off the couch for bread of the earth, he, would, he wouldn't have bread, certainly wouldn't have had bread. And for bread of heaven, for manna, he also would have had bread if he didn't get up off the couch. So the ingredients are the same. You need to have godly intervention, you need to have human, human, human effort. The only difference is in their quantity in their perception. When you looked at bread of, of bread of heaven, it was clear that it came from Hashem. The human effort was so imperceptible that they, they even called it Lechem and They called it he, uh, bread of the heaven. Um, but Arnold, uh, yep. what was, by contrast, what, you want to pick up for us where we're holding here? By, by contrast, contrast, bread of the earth. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, bread from the earth comes through uh, through toil and hard work, leading one to believe that it is he who has accomplished this outcome. Welcome, Steve. His effort and ingen uh, ingenuity. Why indeed is there human involvement with the consumption of heavenly bread? To teach us, and more so, train us to see that human involvement is merely a process that God has planted in the physical world. If we want to achieve, we must put in the effort. Therefore, even though it was it was evident that it was bread from heaven, there still needed to be human involvement. This teaches us that, all, that also bread of the earth, even though there is more human involvement and, and toil, at the core essence is it is God who is blessing our efforts. And God will bless you in all that you do, as Devarim 15. And everything comes from God. This is why the manna was given to the Israelites in the desert before they entered the land of Israel, where they were commanded to work in, uh, in the land in order to teach them this very important lesson. You're involved, but it is God's pro production. I love that line. In order to teach them this lesson, you are involved, but it is God's production. This is really the introduction here we have to the balance that we're going to be discussing over the next two weeks, which is human effort. I was going to say versus, it's not versus. Human effort, the balance of human effort and Hashem's orchestration. Yeah. It's true. Human effort was involved in both of them. But for some reason, by, by manna from heaven, there was more training. There, there was more, number one, teaching, and more training on the trust in Hashem. Hashem said, yes, Throughout your lives as human beings, throughout your lives as a people, you're definitely going to be very, very involved. I'm going to give you more um, perceived control over everything that's going on. You're going to get up at eight o'clock, at seven o'clock in the morning. You'll dive in. You'll go out. By nine o'clock, you'll be working. You'll work from nine to five. You'll come home. How does that song go? He works from nine to five. Right? <laughs> you'll come home and you'll have food. Yeah. And that will seem very much like it's you that accomplished it, and it'll seem very much like it's your credit that you have it. But Hashem said, when I'm establishing you as a people, during the 40 years of the one in the desert, I don't want you to do that yet. Before I allow you that ability to go out into the world to do that, I want to train you by not changing up the whole story, not gonna make miracles. In other words, 
it was a miracle. But I'm saying, I'm not going to make that you're just going to be full. I'm not going to make that the bread is just going to come directly to your mouth. I'm, it's still going to be the same ingredients. Godly orchestration and human effort. But I'm going to flip the, the ratios. I'm going to make it so perceptible that even though there is human effort, it's going to be so clear to you that that human effort pales in comparison to the fact that Hashem is running, is running the show here. It, it was absolutely clear to every single Jew who got up off his couch, even though they needed to, and went to the, to the, to, to the outside their door. I don't know if they had couches in their tents in the desert. <laughs> but they got up of whatever it was, right? And they went outside their door and they picked up the manna. And as they were doing so, I promise you, there was not a single Jew who convinced themselves, oh, look at me, and he beat his chest. Look at me, look how amazing I am that I was able to make so much, so much manna today. Look at me, how much I was able to bring into my family. Nobody said that. Says Hashem, I want to teach you this lesson hardcore. I want you to take that lesson. I want you to live with it for the rest of your life. And it should be passed on to the Jewish people throughout. Trust in Hashem because it's really Him who's orchestrating the whole thing. Yes, you are involved. Yes, you got up off the couch and you're doing whatever it is that you're going about and you, that you're doing in order to make this food come into your mouth or this health or this money or whatever it is that we're talking about come about to your life. But, but remember that it, what the line he uses, you're involved, but this is God's production, right? This is God's show. That's um, an incredible, that's an incredible start off for the human, uh, for the Jewish people. Uh, for absolutely. That recognition. Absolutely. And, and, and imagine, and Arnold, imagine, it wasn't just that Hashem taught this to us with like a one-time story. He yeah. trained us like this over the course of 40 years. 40 years, yeah. 40 years is enough time for a, for a few generations to be trained that way. And to, for it to, to sink into the psyche of the Jewish people. Correct. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why Jewish people are called in the Gemara, ma'amini mini ma'amini. We're called believers and sons of believers. We cannot help but believe in Hashem. Right. It's, it's, it's ingrained. It's hardwired into our very DNA. And so with this, we'll end tonight's lesson. Um, installment number nine of Faith and Trust in God. And really with this, we begin our journey to the balance of human effort and godly orchestration.